and God blessed me with a whole lot of melanin. God chose not to bless Richard with a whole lot of melanin. Don't take, don't be mad at me. Take it up with God. But so races are just something we've made up. That's a, that's a man-made construct. So that's why the scriptures don't actually teach about it because it's man-made. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Doc. My name is Richard Henry and uh, my special guest today is friend Jason Whitaker. He is a husband and a father. He is the purveyor of Dear Well Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Hey man, thanks for having me. <laughs> I appreciate it. Don't do the Rick Caldwell word game on me here, though. Purveyor, <laughs> Purveyor that's that's not too fancy. I don't know. Uh, that sounds a little fancy over here. A little <laughs> fancy over here. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for joining me again. I know we've collabed before and done yeah. other things on other channels, and I've been on your channel, and uh, we've got a great community of people. I know a lot of it's offline. We we share a, a separate platform and Discord channel with several other. YouTubers. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things today. His reason for his channel, mm -hmm. uh, his Presbyterian convictions, how he came to that, uh, just talking about the culture war, and just what it means to be woke and just the ideologies that just are entrenched in our culture. So uh, yeah, anything you want to start off with? You want to tell the, the listener? First well, hey, I, first of all, I appreciate you having me on, man. Thanks so much. I enjoy working with you. We've done tons of things before. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, hanging out with a, with a friend of mine. So I'm glad that you had me come on. I'm glad you put up with me and my multiple reschedules. So uh, <laughs> no, you're good. And such like that. I'm glad I was able to get on today. So uh, let's jump into it. Let's have some fun. Yeah, brother. All right. Well, so the question that a lot of people probably are curious, or maybe they know the answer, but why did you start and how did it come about with the channel, the the content? first on Spotify and then on YouTube, uh, Dear Woke Christian. What, what's what's the story behind that? So make a long story short, the when things started popping off in 2020, I saw the landscape and we saw the the ground swell and the shifting and the the divide forming. And you saw people who professed to be Christian embracing ideologies that were clearly unchristian, not biblical. And you would see things like, uh, I, I think the, the one that really stood out to me the most was um, that time Jordan Peterson was, um, there was a video of him discussing the veracity of the gospel and who Christ is. And he was like, you know, this thing really is real. And he was, he was tearing up and so forth. And out of the, something just made me wanted to ask, want to ask the woke crowd, like, hey, woke Christian, what do you do about this? And so... I started piddling around on Gab and I would like every day just like write a like, hey, dear woke Christian, what do you do about, you know, this Bible verse? Or what do you do about that? And it just kind of materialized into me writing that every day. And then I started writing it as a blog. And you found me when I was doing it as a podcast. I just wanted people to consider that the gospel was so much better than what we've made it out to be. And by lowering and dumbing down the gospel and watering down what Christ has done. We actually are doing no one a favor at all. We actually are damning them because if you don't have the true Christ, you know, Galatians is in play here where you're adding to the gospel and there is no gospel in that way. So I wanted people to think like, Hey, is this the biblical gospel? Is this what the, the gospel or what Christianity is known for almost two millennia or is this something new that we're embracing and bringing into the gospel and bringing into the church so that's why i started writing dear woke christian i wanted to provoke and and encourage conversation and just thinking like hey yeah if this was a biblical truth why did paul not preach about it why did christ not say anything about it why has no one else known about it until last tuesday when you picked it up so <laughs> my my idea was to really get them to think like, this is not a biblical concept. And not only is it not biblical, it's actually damnable. Yeah. So that's why, right? Dear Real Christian. Nice. And you're going, you, you, you had a website, you still have a website. You're going to be blogging there more, right? You're going to be spending Dear some more Real time Christian. there. Com. Yep. Perfect. So look out for that. I'm sure many of my listeners, I know they already know you because uh, we do a lot of crossover and cross pollination and whatnot. Uh, no, that's very helpful. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Cause, and that's, that's really good question uh, or, or, uh, statement in the sense that 
Yeah, but why didn't we hear about this sooner? I've heard you say even talking about, you know, your favorite woke theologian from the 15th century or something like yeah, that. Like, and it's that was a question. Like, yeah. Well, what, what was the critical race theory equivalent <laughs> from the 900s? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, what I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crickets, utter crickets. Yeah. No, it's, it's a really good point. Um, so to be clear, obviously you have, you've gotten quite a bit of, into good trouble, I would say, and lots of supporters and drawing mm -hmm. up a lot of people, not only saying thank you, but also, you know, having good conversations and maybe questioning what they believe and why they believe it. Uh, just so everybody's clear, what does it mean to be woke? So now, as with many things in, in the modern day vernacular, definitions are written in sand. They're very no. rarely written in, in stone and for sure hardly ever written in ink. So when I say woke, I am saying that somebody who has embraced the ideas of critical race theory. And again, somebody's going to say, well, what is critical race theory? Yeah. And I use a, a pretty basic general definition that every disparance or every form of disagreement or every form of, um, um, of inequity can be boiled down to race is a, is a very simple my simple definition of critical race theory is not a is not a, a classical definition. There are tons of other definitions. If you ask 10 people, you're going to get 13 different answers. What is critical race theory? And so a, a person who is woke is somebody who is embracing those ideas that there is some level of oppression in every way, shape and form. Um, there's a there's a form of oppression in every kind of disagreement. So, for example, Richard has Richard makes X amount of dollars. He lives in this type of house. Jason does not have X amount of dollars. I make considerably less than Richard and I live in considerably lower level of a house. The only reason that that's true is because of race. Then no, well, and, and of course your, your listeners and yourself, Richard, you probably would say, well, there's probably some other things at play. Nope. The only, only answer is Richard has less melanin. I have more melanin. Richard's an oppressor. I'm oppress E. Give me my money. So that so that that would be my definition. There's gonna be somebody that disagrees. Let me know down in the comment section below or dearwokec at gmail.com. I'll gladly we can parse it out. But when I say woke, they've embraced a lot of the nomenclature, a lot of the the word usage of basically progressives. But that would be my my they, they've embraced that every kind of disagreement every kind of disparance or inequity rather is because of race that would be my pushback that would be my answer gotcha so then i guess to expand on that a little bit what because i've had a few conversations with people and sitting before i was pastoring working in uh selling uh selling in sales for mm -hmm. cell phones and tablets and devices and things for verizon uh and i had a few friends that were far more co-workers really that were far more uh, shall we say sensitive, right? Okay. So they're sensitive to that or, Hey, there are disparities and so on and so forth. What do you tell someone who says, yeah, but there's problems though. There are a lot of problems. There's a lot of issues in the world. Race. I mean, are you saying there's, there's no racism, Jason? Are yep. you saying that there's saying. not, there's not partiality. There's not wickedness. I mean, people, I mean, we've been oppressed, you know, as a, as a, as a minority for 400 years and you don't, you don't see that. Well, why don't you, oh. why don't you care? Like, what do you tell okay. people like that? Um, <laughs> well, one, there's no such thing as racist. So mm -hmm. we're just talking about the difference between Richard and myself. The difference between you and another person is really melanin content. Yeah, they might have been they might have some physical features that are a little bit different. They might come from a region around the world that maybe they're taller than you or maybe they have um, a, wider noses or whatever. But at the end of the day, all we're talking about is melanin. That's really it. And God bless me with a whole lot of melanin. God chose not to bless Richard with a whole lot of melanin. Don't take don't be mad at me. Take it up with God. But so races are just something we've made up. That's a that's a man-made construct. So that's why the scriptures don't actually teach about it, because it's man-made. Kind of like that's why I don't talk about McDonald's in the Bible. It's something man made up. So because of that, I'm not beholden to your arguments. So I'm not gonna argue from nope, I'm not gonna argue about races. 
All right. No, I appreciate that, brother. Yeah. I mean, it's you're you're correct to hear or say that there are, you know, a million different definitions mm -hmm. uh, for so many different things, especially in our modern parlance. So um, the it, it's yeah, I mean, basically you embrace critical race theory, at least in the tenets. I know some people don't. Oh, that's a legal theory. I don't embrace that. It's like I've heard people say, well, it's it's the praxis of it. You're just actually embracing the the ideologies behind it you don't know you're not going through some legal theory from 40 50 years ago but rather you're just or 30 years ago whatever it was but you're still using the ideologies of he's oppressor i'm oppressed victim victimizer and there's never any sort of what i've noticed too personally there's no grace there's no forgiveness there's no grace you're canceled that's it which of course is antithetical to the gospel absolutely and I always ask people, you know what, because there is so many definitions of woke and, and CRT, just explain to me, how do you deal with certain situations? How do you see, like, I'll just ask, like, hey, the shooting here, this yeah. cop situation here, how do you see it? And they'll usually tell you. It doesn't take long for them to explain. And yeah. you'll see, oh, so you believe that this person deserves this job simply because his or her ethnicity not because of their ability, their skills, and what they bring to the table, but simply because they represent a, pers a certain people group. Is that, did I understand you correctly? Got you, perfect. Because whether you call that critical race theory, whether you call that orange lima bean is totally irrelevant. <laughs> what you've just described is unbiblical. And by definition of James, that is partiality. Yeah. And we have a problem. So now we have to deal with that. So let's unpack why it is that you feel that way and you profess to be a Christian. Because again, pagans are gonna pagans. I want y'all to keep paganing. Christians should not be embracing pagan, paganistic ideas when you profess to be in Christ. There's a problem there. Yeah. So that's usually how you can get through it real quick and easy. Like, hey, you know what? There's a thousand different definitions, but really at the end of the day, critical race theory is partiality. And it, it is a form of hyper partiality. So. Let me just ask you a couple questions. How did you, how do you perceive this situation? How do you unpack it? And they're usually going to pull out all of the tenets of critical race theory. And these are how I apply it. Like, oh, what do you know? That's partiality. And that's unbiblical. And as you said, you know, we, and we can definitely get into it because I tell people all the time, critical race theory is a different religion. It is not Christianity. It can't be yeah. one because y'all just made it up two weeks ago, but two, <laughs> It's as you just said, there is no grace. I mean, there there's a different Christ yeah. in the I in the critical race theory cult. There's a different sins, there's a different salvation, there's different repentance. There's everything that we believe as Christians is different in yeah. critical race theory. Because it doesn't apply the same way. Because the sin of critical race theory is that Richard is a white man. And that's it. That's the sin that he's done. So how do you give the gospel? How do I, as a critical race theory proponent, give the gospel to Richard? I can't because yeah. there is no salvation. Right. And so with Richard being the supreme sinner who cannot get salvation, you know what that also means? That I am righteous. I don't need salvation. Many people don't argue. And if you put, of course, there's 10 people. But that's people the logical chat, ends, right? I mean, that's, right? that's the, the end. end. That's the end of the game. A lot of people will, will comment down below that Jason's wrong, but just ask enough questions. I always yeah. tell you, ask more questions. It's okay. Yeah. I, I have zero issue with you asking questions about my savior. I will answer every one of them. Even the dumb ones, like what size was Moses's gym shoes? Okay, fine. We'll answer <laughs> those questions. But you have to answer the question for me. How do you, as a person of high melanin or a person of color, how do you give the gospel to your white neighbor? Yeah. And then better question is, what is the gospel? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's good. That really is because I, I don't think most people really, nope. really understand it or they do, they understand, you know, the second grade reading level sort of thing mm -hmm. of it. But then they don't understand once they continue in this full and then they get a high school degree and a college degree and they're working on their master's in critical theory, as it were, to go with the analogy that there it, it builds on itself to the point of you can't 
this guy can't get saved. This guy doesn't need to get saved. And yep. so therefore the gospel is completely neutered and we don't we don't need Christ at all. In fact, all we need to do is do the work, quote unquote, which, of course, is antithetical to the gospel of working. Don't that, uh, don't that working sound like a different salvation? Don't that sound like a different gospel? Brother, it really does. Like religion? I, mean, I, I mean, you're the first person I heard a while back say that CRT is a cult. It's a cult. And, and I think I, mean, I love history myself. I know a lot of people, you know, maybe don't always appreciate it. But once they understand that bad ideas, oftentimes good ideas, too, oftentimes will repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, very few people saw 100 plus years ago. And this will take us to our Presbyterian question in a moment. But within mm -hmm. Jay Gresham Machen and the Presbyterian Church USA, which is still around mm -hmm. and rank liberal, woke alphabet mafia, everybody, women preachers, lesbian, trans, midget, disabled, everything, right? Intersectional, everything. These people are still around. I mean, they're hemorrhaging members like crazy, mm -hmm. but they're still around. And he said, this isn't, this isn't a matter of like, well, you know, we would rather preach the gospel and then give a meal on Wednesday nights versus you guys want to give a meal and then preach the gospel. Or, you know, as A.D. Robles and others will say, you know, it's not Democrats and Republicans talking about a 10 percent and a 12 percent tax bracket. Right. We're talking about murdering babies. We're talking about trans people. We're talking about fleshly mutilation. We're talking about a different gospel. Different and Machen gospel. was saying these people, the, the liberal Christians in the mainline Protestant denominations, especially, they're not just, well, you know, just a little different flavor. You don't wear a tie. I'm going to wear a tie and a robe. Like, that's not the debate. It's another gospel. And I think now we see that 100 plus years later. And I think, you know, in short order, even in the next decade or two, probably in our lifetimes, we'll see very quickly that this is another gospel and it is another religion altogether. So that's uh, we'll coin it and I'll, I'll, I'll give you props when we're on some panel two decades from now. And I'll, uh, I love it. I'll, I'll pat I, you on the back. I'm like this guy. He knew no, it. He, you can, he was the you first can one. have it. You can have it. No problem at all. <laughs> No, it's good. Uh, well, again, so you used to be, so you've been a believer for a while. You're a Presbyterian now in the PCA, mm -hmm. a. PC, P, not PC USA, but just no, the sir. A, the United States here, just the America. And uh, just kidding. But you're a deacon. You have a wife. You have, mm -hmm. you have two girls. Yep. You guys serve in a church. But you didn't always... Uh, you didn't always have Presbyterian convictions. How did you, where were you before and how did you come to that, uh, that conclusion as it were? I love it. Love it. Great question. So I was actually a, um, I was attending a purpose driven church. If anybody's followed me for 10 minutes, you've probably heard that I got beef with the purpose driven church. So I was attending a purpose driven church for quite some time and really 15 years. And to be honest with you, Richard, I don't believe I was converted. I don't believe I actually knew who Christ was. I had a, 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 a surface faith. Um, you know, I prayed a prayer, faith in a faith in a faith in, in, a, in a prayer. But I did not actually I wasn't actually converted. I don't believe I was converted. So and we can talk about this on a definitely a longer show. But one of the things about purpose driven is it really coddles and creates an environment that allows sin to fester. So one of the things that a lot of things a lot of people notice is that people who embrace purpose-driven seeker sensitive attractional church they end up their churches end up having be full of sin because they literally open the doors up for people it doesn't matter if you're converted you don't have to be a christian to be a member we just want you to come in you can wow. come in if you want to you know park cars and shake babies and kiss hands no problem we want you to do <laughs> we want you to be here to do that yeah um because we need cogs in the machine so um the church that the, the false church that I was a part of was just full of, I mean, the pastor had multiple, the speaker had multiple adulterous affairs Ugh. and it was, it was terrible. So I was really tired. I was like, man, this something is just not right, but I didn't know exactly what it was. And sadly I had not really put my thumb on it, that thumb on it, that it was purpose driven was really the, 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 the safe place for this sin to keep running amok. But I knew I wanted to leave. I knew I wanted to leave. So started fiddling around like everybody does, messing around on YouTube. And I started finding these, these sermon jams. And for the life of me, I really wish I could find who it was that was putting out these sermon jams. Cause I met Paul Washer and RC Sproul and John MacArthur, Vody Bauckham. I didn't know any of these people um, before then. And I was like, wow, 
this is it. So, and of course, sermon jams are the gateway drugs to expositional, expositional preaching. So I started listening to expositional preaching. I'm like, this is not what I've been listening to. This stuff is amazing. What in the world? That junk I've been listening to, that, that topical clownery, what is this? So lo and behold, fast, fast forward, um, the speaker at the false church that I attended had yet another affair. This, and, and what would happen is there would be affairs and a, a, it would come, it would, it would be exposed. He would go take like this, you know, three month sabbatical, basically let the, let the smoke die down, let, you know, some other people preach and whatnot, he, him still getting paid. And then he'd come back and nothing ever changed. They would be like, you know, 10% of the people leave or whatever. But wow. as long as there was still lights were on, he was fine. How big was this church? It was easily 6,000 at one point. So it was a, it was a very nice size. Um, and it, were, it, it was, it was a, a, a happening place, as most attractional churches are here in Atlanta. They, yeah. they, they draw you in with the music. They draw you in with the, with the, the sizzle. But there is yeah. no steak. They, there's, there's, there's lots of smoke, but there's, like, there's no fire. There's, there's, yeah. no, there's no preaching of God's word. So wow. I had already gotten kind of hooked on this expositional preaching thing. And um, after the after the, the next affair, I said, babe, we're not going back here. This is not going to keep it. This don't make no dang sense. I'm not going to be a part of this. So we quit. And we tried home church for a moment. That didn't work. And this is well before, you know, COVID and live streaming and stuff like that. I said, man, we got to go find a church. So our kids were attending a private school. And I said, hey, let's, um, but I knew what I didn't want. I did not want an attractional church. So I was so pious. I would go to their websites and I would look at the church's website and say, nope, not even going there. Because I could tell like everybody was using the same format. Everybody's using the same template. Um, or I would look at their about page or I look at what are the resources they would offer. You know, like, read these resources and whatnot. Long story short. So our daughters went to, we're going to a private school. And I said, well, we don't have a problem with what they're learning. I didn't know. I knew nothing about Presbyterianism, nothing. Um, and now mind you, I, was, I had been going to a predominantly black, um, very borderline charismatic church. So you're talking about a lot of energy, a lot of dance, a, a concert. Is that the little, secret church? The yes. 6,000? Okay. Yeah. This is a, this is a concert with a really bad Ted talk. Okay. So that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. So I left there and then we walk into Smyrna Presbyterian mm -hmm. and we're talking about a significant difference. Um, however, that was my first time. Remember I told you, I'm like, man, this expositional preaching thing is great. Yeah. This is my first time actually sitting in an expositional sermon. I said, oh my goodness, I, I this is what I've been missing. And uh, jumping around a little bit, that is how we ended up at Smyrna Press. That's awesome, man. That's good. I mean, I know I, I'm, I'm such, sometimes I'm so, this might throw people for a loop. I want to really try and be people pleasery. And that's, that's, you know, that's a part of the flesh that I have to kill. Uh, probably why I do a YouTube because I want to like, just kill it and just like, mm -hmm. you know, salt on the wound sort of thing. But I want to give the benefit of the doubt to the thousand, five thousand, thirty thousand people churches, the multi-campus churches, the this, the, uh, I don't, I don't want to have a smoke machine. I don't, I'm not going to wear $800 sneakers. I'm not going to have no pulpit, uh, but I, I just still there's that there, uh, you know, and there's like this point of like, yeah, but God's grace is bigger and it is right. And ultimately mm -hmm. it's not about this. And if you have this, you're saved. And if you don't have this, you're not saved. There's plenty of, you know, Arminians, plenty of Calvinists, plenty of young earth, old earth, whatever, who aren't, who believe quote unquote, all the right things yet have never actually repented and turned to Christ. That does happen. Uh, oh, just like there's plenty of people who are just stuck in terrible churches and they love Jesus, but they're first graders and their theology. And, and, and instead of, you know, trying to excel and be excellent, but it's, it's difficult. And every time I hear stories about a situation just like that it just kind of puts another nail in that coffin of no <laughs> that's 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 really not how you do church there's no biblical warrant for any of that and, and you know there's no biblical warrant for a pew necessarily or a pulpit necessarily or a tie necessarily either i understand that but uh 
I think the difference is God's word, God's holiness, man and mankind's brokenness and sinfulness. And then if you look over here, it's completely the opposite. You know, everything, everything's almost inverted to the point of, no, it's all about God blessing you and giving you money and giving you this, giving you oh, health, wow. wealth, and prosperity. This is, and really it boils down to those things of what is the local church? Is it an outreach where you want people to come in, fill the doors? And I've struggled with this a little bit, the church mm -hmm. I pastor, because uh, the one, one or two of the previous guys, that was really his, his mantra from my understanding. I mean, I've never said it under his teaching, never met him, but from what I could tell, that was the idea. You know, they have big midweek things. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Bus ministry, because we're more rural country church, but okay. still having the bus ministry. People are getting worn out, though. It's costing a lot of money to run this, get food, do all this thing, Awana and everything else. And yet there's zero seeds. Now, you know, Lord Sovereign, and he could plant seeds and people could see and repent 20 years later, right? Mm -hmm. But is the church outreach or is it Christians worshiping God, right? And and that's and that's yes, you have you can have you have both, but what's the primary focus? Is it a mission or is it Christians together worshiping? And I think right. that's where a lot of people uh, just don't they can't tell the difference or they don't know there's a difference and think, well, you don't preach the gospel to unbelievers. Of course I do, but we're doing church this way. We're never going to have. And Elton John, you're never going to beat Elton John or Cher or, you know, Miley Cyrus or whatever with the music, with this, with the cool TED talk, with the secularism. You're never going to beat the world. So don't be like the world at all. Be of Christ because you're ultimately worshiping him. So anyway, that's my own one of my. No, I, I agree with you. Boxes, and, so. and keep in mind, Rick Warren, actually, now he wasn't the genesis of the attractional church. Yeah. However, Rick Warren definitely gets a lot of the publicity and a lot of it was carried by his by his efforts he changed the definition and what church actually is yeah whereas it's not an assembly of those who are called out but rather an outreach or rather a you know a, a concert with a bad spiritual ted talk whatever like that <laughs> yeah. but i mean he was really one of those people that pushed that idea that what you what you consider church is not what church is, but rather it is an outreach. It is all these other things rather than a, an assembly of people who are answering call the call of their God to come and worship him. Right. So, I mean, it does it. Um, granted, scripture doesn't know anything about it, that they, but we we embraced it. Um, you I believe it was Stephen Furtick. Stephen Furtick has said it a lot, but I believe it's also said in the purpose driven church. I haven't read it. In, many many years but church is for the unbeliever yeah and that was one of the main things that I finally hit me i was like wait how did we wait what <laughs> one day it finally just hit me like yeah. wait wow church is for the unbeliever where did we get that from yeah and so that was really one of the that was one of the things that really pushed me out of the purpose-driven church when i realized like we've been saying this for a long time and scripture doesn't know anything about it why do we say that? That's not yeah. true. I, and I just wanted to point that out because I think you you were definitely on to that. So um, I'd love to get into baptism, but um, <laughs> as a as a, to, a Baptist and a Presbyterian walk into a coffee shop. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, is there? I guess just I mean, tongue and cheek aside. Obviously, we're probably not going to convince each other. But did you? come into i mean obviously you guys everybody you're adults uh and your girls are how old were the girls when when you started going to the uh probably about five and seven okay give or take so did you baptize them and you guys got baptized as well is that how that works um my wife and i did not get rebaptized or baptized okay. again the girls had never been so they were okay um when they became members gotcha. so they went through communicant class they sat with the elders, gave a profession of faith, explained a profession of faith, which to me, if, if nothing else, if nothing else, to hear your children explain why they trust Christ uh. is, I'm sorry, I, I, I'll miss baby dedications all the time for that. <laughs> so yeah. no, but to hear your children explain wh why they believe this. Yeah. And again, now, does that mean that they, you just, 
you say, whoo, I don't have to worry about discipling my kids. Or, whoo, got that, whoo, got that checked off. No, it, constantly, trust me. If you know my kids, it's constant. <laughs> yeah. You got it. But to, to hear them articulate the faith is, is outstanding. So they, they went before the session, they explained themselves. And several of my elders came to me and said, Jason, we've had a lot of people come before the session. We've had a lot of adults come before the session and your kids may very well be some of the best explanations of their faith that oh. we've ever heard. So that's good. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm all about it. So now yeah. at least we know that they have an understanding. Yeah. Um, yes, they were baptized. Absolutely. Um, and so, and then, and now they're full bore members and that's a little bit more for the polity sake of, uh, Presbyterianism that they can, they can vote, they can, they can recommend and suggest elders and deacons. They yeah. have a voice as it relates to congregational decisions and such. But, um, so I guess to capitalize or, or build on that a little bit, what had, I guess a lot of people, you know, cause basically non-denominational American Christianity, not necessarily the seeker stuff. I feel like that's kind of its own thing, but close. Uh, but there's a lot of just Bible churches. Hey, I'm just a, I'm just a Christian, you know, mm -hmm. and there's here in Kentucky, there's mainly ba Baptist, all sorts of types of Baptists, some yeah. Methodists, very few Presbyterians, some Roman Catholic, and then even, uh, I don't know, any Lutheran at all, anywhere. Uh, that's neither here nor there, but uh, a lot of Christian churches too. But then you go further West, there's a lot of non-denominational and there's yeah. still Baptist churches. It's still believers' sure. baptism and so on. Uh, had you, back to the question, had the girls, your daughters, not professed faith, would you still have, do they still get to be baptized? Because I know, obviously, sometimes you're Presbyterian, third, fourth generation, you have kids. And from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, you baptize the babies. But it's not necessarily a, hey, Ethiopian eunuch, this guy's believing, let's baptize him type of baptism, it's something different. Can you explain that a little bit? So, um, no, if, if our, if our daughters were not professing faith at all, they would not have been baptized. Okay. Um, and so let's, let's, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to muddy up the waters of baptism because there's a lot of, there's almost two camps of baptism there. There's true Baptist. And then I think what a lot of them call is a baptismic. <laughs> like people who kind of do Baptist things, but don't really subscribe to the full Baptist sure. teaching. <laughs> That's what a lot of non-denominations non fall into. Right, right, right. So, Baptistic, yeah. Yeah, we do. We do. Let's, so let's jump to the, the issue at hand. We do baptize babies. We do believe that if you and Jenny, me and Jima, we are believers and we have little people in arm, that they are part of the covenant that God has made with you, with the Henry family or with the Whitaker family. And so therefore... If, if you were joining our church, we would want you and your wife to be members and we would baptize your baby in, in, in a sign and um, acknowledgement that God has made a covenant with his people, which are you and your wife, me and my wife, and a little person in arm is a part of that. That does not mean that they are saved. They will yeah. still need to be discipled. They will still need to be come. And let's say you stay there for, let's fast forward, 15 years. So now that little person in arm is now 15 years old or, or, or an older child, they can go through communicant class where they're taught and understood. They understand what is the process, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be trusting in Christ for their salvation? They have time to cogitate on that, spend time with mom and dad, dad and mom explain it to them and such. And then they say, you know, mom, dad, I believe that I trust Christ and Christ alone. Then yeah. okay, not a problem then you can go sit before the session and you can explain that to them. And it's usually the, the deacons or elders or, or whatnot and the pastor of the church, they explain that to them. And they're like, okay, yes, we, we, we trust that that profession of faith is genuine. Now at the end of the day, you could be pulling our leg Ask right. Abraham Piper. Um, you could be pulling somebody's <laughs> yeah. leg. However, the, after that, they're saying, yes, this, this young lad, um, the Henry baby or the Whitaker baby, who's now a teenager or whatnot, is yes, they have a profession of faith. They understand all that it requires. They are they can be full bore members yeah. of the church. And so they would not need to be baptized again. Okay. 
I was going to ask that. Okay. That would not need to be baptized again. But let's let's just say you and Jenny just walked in off the street and had never um, you you know you're a full grown man. You and your wife are full grown, but you have a little person, maybe you know middle schooler or maybe elementary school age kid, never been baptized, never been baby dedicated, whatnot like that. Um, the the ask would be, would you like your child to be baptized? And you say, yes, absolutely. Then they're going to go through communicate class, the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Again, to make sure that they understand. I think to me, for, for me, the baptism is, is such a, a small issue or small part of it. When yeah. I know what we're doing as relates to making sure that your child or making sure the, the young adult and even the adult understands what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. So whether or not they sprinkle some water on you, they dunk you down in there, whatever, I'm okay with all of that because I know that we're making every attempt, and, and I, I can say Smyrna Press, makes every attempt to make sure that the little little Whitaker, the little Henry, whether it be the baby in arms or the child that comes in, is aware of what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. And not just, hey, we, we dunked you, we sprinkled you, and you can go live any way you want to. That's yeah. never, that you will never hear that as yeah. a um, 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 pushed at, 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 at Smyrna Press. I can say that emphatically with yeah. a high level of certainty. You'll never hear that. So that's why I don't get too caught up in the weeds about whether or not we sprinkle a baby or whatnot, because I know that we do a lot to make sure that that baby, when they become older, is is a Christian, not just, yeah. well, they got sprinkled when they were six months old. We don't have to worry about them, which right. is sometimes how people present it. But um <laughs> No, that's a good point. And I mean, I, I, I try and push back uh, in, in I mean, that's one of the reasons why I have a channel uh, and, and produce content because so often you, especially in, in the church, if you grow up in the church or you come to faith a little bit later, or like you and me, both we were, you know, a fam familiar, I didn't go to secret church, but just went to like a weak sauce church and wasn't saved till I was maybe 24 or 25. And so as an adult, you th see things very differently, very stark. But a lot of people in, you know, Baptist circles and so on will say they'll, they won't see the other side. They won't take time to learn or ask a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or something like that. And say, okay, so hold on. So you think baptism saves you or no, I don't think that. So you think that you don't have to do this. No, we don't think that. No, we think this. We do. And you spend like half an hour and ask the person. You're so yeah. much better, you know, with the same person. And like, oh, you believe the, the the universe is billions of years old. Why do you do? Well, you think this. Well, you think you think God's just on his rocker. Or you think the earth is, is recent. It's old It's or it's young. And why do you think that? Like, are you anti-science? You know, and there's certain things. You just ask these questions and think, oh, we're made in God's image. We have intellect and mind. And we're trying to live unto the Lord. So often people just kind of kick their feet up and they just relax and think, ah, I'm, I'm good. And in Baptist circles, especially, you know, country, uh, rural type, you know, Timmy got baptized when he was five. You know, there's this like this pseudo Presbyterian, like we wait, but we still don't do any discipleship. We right. don't make sure Timmy actually knows the gospel, knows Jesus. There seems to be no life change. He's still a little hellion and he doesn't do anything different from when he was four versus five and now he's 15 still not doing anything there is no repentance in his heart in his mind and then he gets drunk and smashes into a car kills himself at 16 17 and then you know the pastor's up there saying little timmy's in heaven with jesus this and this and this and it's like well because he got baptized and it's like but baptism doesn't save you it doesn't save you in the presbyterian church it doesn't save you in the baptist church it doesn't save you in the lutheran or anywhere else and so that's where you know, somebody who might be thinking, well, I don't know, Jason was Presbyterian. I can't believe that. Or I don't know, Richard was Southern Baptist or, you know, whatever. It's like nobody says, at least in my circles, and it doesn't sound like in yours, that baptism saves you. Now, if you want to, there's a few groups that do. There are groups that do that. Yeah. That do say that, which I think is, is wrong because I mean, it's from Peter. But then he goes back. It's like saying that, you know, with the day, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And then he repeats it and says a thousand years is like a day. <laughs> and so it's like, it cancels itself out, meaning God is timeless, not that God created on day one, it was a thousand years and day two is a thousand years and so on. Right, right. And, you know, that's just a silly argument. I think we, uh, if, if we all just took, just, I, I, and not to make Presbyterians better than anybody else, but, because I didn't, 
I just think, hey, if we just make it a point to say, hey, okay, whether they were whether they were dunked, they were baptized, I mean, um, sprinkled, baby dedicated, you know, that's yeah. a big thing in predominantly black churches is irrelevant. Yeah, Baptist it's churches whether or not too, you yeah. are discipling your child is yeah. the question of the day. I, I think we should get past, okay, how did you baptize them and get into, did you disciple them? Right. Do, do your Does your child know who Christ is yeah. beyond this event, whether they were soaked, sprinkled, whatever? Yeah. Like, do they know who Christ is? And that, if we made that our, the, the main question, I think we would really settle quite a bit, but yeah, no, that's, that's good. Well, I like that. I appreciate that. Um, last question. What do you, and this kind of folds in with the last one we were just talking about with child rearing and everything else, you and your wife, your girls, your church, how do you stave off the cultural rot and the, the cancer that is constantly growing and pressing in from all different angles at different times of the day, different times of the year um, and raise your children unto the Lord and also some words for, of encouragement for, for the listener as well. Well, first of all, I'm not doing, I don't feel like I'm doing like the super bang up, not, you know, fantastic job. Yep. So please know that we're always improving, constantly reforming. So I would just say the scriptures are sufficient. I know that sounds really basic but the bible is sufficient the lord saw fit to give us everything that we needed for life and godliness so whether it's staving off the cultural rot from outside or inside your house or inside of you yeah the scriptures are sufficient you need only not not only let me let me back that up you do need you can use some extra outside influence so for example um if, if Richard and I lived in the same community, I, Richard could help me in a particular area to, you know, maybe check on me because I'm, you know, yelling at, my, yelling at my wife and kids. Or Richard can be like, hey, Jason, you know, come by every day and check on it. Like, hey, yeah. gee, is he still yelling? You know, that kind of stuff. So that would be yeah. an extra outside. But the inside, the inside um, measure is the scriptures. The scriptures teach us how to deal with our anger and our, our upsetness and our Dis displeasure and so forth in a way that's pleasing and honoring to God and not dishonoring to others around our family and which are basically heirs of salvation with us. So yeah. knowing that the Bible is sufficient, I think would be the, 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 the main thing, look at the Bible, not as a storybook, not as a, a bunch of quotes that are, that you can just pull out a quote and just quote it, but no, it is sufficient to it. I mean, God has given you everything that you need in the scriptures to know him fully and yeah. to be transformed inwardly. So that would be my first thing. And then also be confident in, once you know that the Bible is sufficient, be confident in that sufficiency. So you don't have to say, you know, I don't have to capitulate and say, well, you know, little Tommy thinks he's a little Jenny today. Nope. Yeah. The Bible doesn't say that that's true. Yeah. It's really that easy. Like I, it does. People want to make us sound like clowns because we don't believe that, um, a little boy could be a little girl today and then tomorrow could be a tree and next week could be a rabbit. No, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. Yeah. God didn't say if God thought that it was important for us to just transition in our gender fluidity, then he would have made that very, very clear. If yeah. God thought that races were going to be a big thing, he would have made it extremely clear. Cause see, it, it seems like God puts the things that are important. He puts them very at, at, at eye level, even low on the shelf. Like who Christ is, is extremely low on the shelf. Okay. Heaven and what all of the, 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 the glory and wonder of heaven, that's on one of those higher shelves. So we don't really, we don't have a good picture of that, but we got a perfect picture of who Christ is. And it's at a nice level for everybody to, to, to be able to grasp yeah. and get it. All you got to do is want to. So that being the case, so, so the things that are important and that are important to God are clearly important to us. And he made those very clear in his scripture. So therefore, what I encourage people to do is start with the scriptures. The Bible is sufficient and just trust it. Just trust. It's okay to say, nah, yeah, nah, no. Well, well, why don't you do that? 
Uh, matter of fact, in uh, about six days, we're going to have 30 days of showing that you, <laughs> what do you believe? So, um, and, and you can say, no, nah, I'm, I'm not going to support that. I'm not confused in this area. Well, why are you not? Because the Bible doesn't say it. Because God made it very clear what, yeah. how we are and should behave. And there it is. That's it. And I think by doing that, we do away with a lot of the foolishness. We do away with a lot of the, the inconsistencies and the such like that. And we set ourselves up for more success because ultimately, keep in mind, we're doing this for the honor and glory of Christ. So yeah. I don't do this to get the mob and the social media um, people get their approval. I do this for the audience of one. And so that would be my... Now, there's tons of different other answers I could probably give, but I would just say start with the scriptures. They are sufficient and trust that what they say is sufficient. And that's it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, no, it's everything pertaining to life and godliness, right? So yeah. that's something that I think we so often, even in my own heart, and sometimes I'll pay, and when I pay attention to stuff, there still seems like, yeah, but I want something a little bit more. You want someone else to also say that this thing is wrong and this thing is right. right. You want someone else to say, you know, because then we we go back and think, yeah, well, the TED Talk said this, though. And also, uh, you know, the White House said that. And also right. CNN said the same thing. And so you're telling me the TED Talk, CNN and the White House are wrong. And your old, your old book is right. You know, and that's, and that's exactly, you know, and that's and that's where as Christians, it's so much better, ultimately, because Christ is better. And, and to say that you have this sure and steady anchor, the anchor mm -hmm. of the soul, and not yes. just saying, oh, you know, maybe my kid's uh, a cat today. You know, and, and maybe, he's a, maybe he's a tree. Or, you know, my son is, he was Gollum two days ago. We've been w working Ooh. through the Lord of the Rings movies. And the next morning, he was just wearing his underwear. And he's jumping around. He's, you know, five years old. And he's, he's really thin and fit. So he looked like a little mini Gollum. And he's all, Arr! and I was like, oh, hey, Gollum. You know, and it's like, <laughs> is he really Gollum? Of course not. No one in their right mind would say that. But if all of a sudden somebody gets wind that my son says, you know, I'm, I'm Amelia, my oldest daughter, then all of a sudden he is, and we got to do this whole thing and do some mutilation and, and, and hormone evil. blockers. And yeah. it's like, excuse me? <laughs> what is wrong with you? And yet, you know, people, when they, they say they don't, whatever the phrase is, people, if they don't believe anything, they'll, they don't, when they believe nothing, they'll believe anything is yes. the phrase. And it's, it's sad, but true. And, and anyway, so I appreciate that, brother. You got anything else, hey. lastly, you want to add? Man, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much, Richard, for having me. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Finally, finally worked out. So it's good. Well, go check out Jason's channel, if you haven't already, Dear Woke Christian, uh, on YouTube and at dearwokechristian.com com yep as well that is great so let's look for that some blogging also and you can support him uh through buy me a cup of coffee is buy me is, a coffee it's like yeah, absolutely. A, it's like a patreon uh and you're gonna actually have some content uh, behind the paywall for things like that as well so mm -hmm. if you're a supporter there uh jason will get some content he might be he's already telling me to do the same thing so we'll come see. on richard join uh, us we'll see how that goes yeah i mean i have it and a few people have, have supported but i don't have any cool. like paywall uh paywall stuff yet but anyway uh this is it brother i appreciate right. the time and everybody uh, thank you for this please share this and uh yeah y'all take care have a great rest of your day take care everybody thanks